morning, everyone. Welcome to live worship at Grace Church. That wasn't our worship team that was just singing that song. That was Francesca Battistelli. But we do sing that song in our normal uh, worship time. Uh, if you were on our Facebook page, you uh, would have seen a picture uh, today. Uh, something different than what I'm used to seeing in a blank, empty uh, fellowship hall. I have some friends here this morning and some pictures. Uh, so thanks to everybody for doing that. I appreciate it. Um, I kind of, when I walked in, I didn't know what it was. I kind of walked in thinking, what in the world is in front of the fellowship hall? I locked the door and we have an alarm for things such like this, but I come in and there's all these pictures of a bunch of you from Grace Church looking at me, staring at me, nice little encouraging sayings, thanking me. And so I appreciate uh, you guys doing that and to those organizers who put all that together. So I get to look out like I'm looking out on a Sunday and yell at people. I can see Vince and I can tell him, Vince, it's time to start. Sit down. Uh, I can see a great picture of Ed and Beth Zappé. They look a little bit younger in that picture, but it's a great uh, representation of Ed and Beth Zappé. And I kind of feel a little bit like one of my top five all-time favorite movies, uh, It's a Wonderful Life, and George Bailey. And he walks in, and he's standing there, and all of his friends just start coming in. And that's kind of what I feel like, except there's no exchange of money. Yeah. Nobody's coming in and dropping piles of money on the table, although if you would, I would accept it, uh, but you're not doing that. But thanks for putting the pictures up here. Uh, I did post a picture that you can see at the end of uh, worship. I'll uh, pan the camera around so you can see what I'm seeing. I was afraid to do it right now because uh, I don't want it to freeze up like it did the other time, and we have that kind of issue that we had before. So I'll I'll not do that right now, but at the end of the service, I'll pan it around so you guys can see the pictures that I'm looking at. So thanks for uh, submitting all those, or uh, like I said, people who organized it, put it all together. It looks great. And I finally get to preach to people today, because I'm usually preaching to no one in the fellowship hall, but I get to look at all of you and, and preach to you. So thank you. Uh, not a lot of announcements for this Sunday morning. As I said, things you can look for coming up this week. We'll do another update on Tuesday, and you probably saw some information being put out by our governor about things reopening in Pennsylvania and, and the timeline for all that. So uh, we will have a, a leadership team meeting, and um, perhaps not this Tuesday, but uh, certainly by next Tuesday, uh, we'll have some more information about what that looks like for Grace Church and Grace Church Ministries. Uh, the other thing I want to update you on this week, and I'll, I'll do that again uh, on our Facebook page uh, regarding our uh, financial picture. A couple of people had asked about that. You've been faithfully sending in uh, uh, your offerings to either the church or using our new online feature, which I appreciate, but I do want to just update everybody on where we're at financially because you're not seeing that every Sunday like you typically do. Uh, so I'll put that out this week as well at our Facebook page and just uh, give you some uh, slides and see where we are, where we were, where we're at now and, and what that means going forward. So you can look forward to that too. Um, and then uh, we'll plan uh, for sure next Sunday, uh, May 10th, which is, is Mother's Day. Uh, to be on Facebook Live again, live streaming um, for our worship service. And hopefully in the next week or two, we'll have some more information about uh, what things will look like going, going forward for Grace Church Ministries. Uh, as I say every Sunday, and as you should be aware, if you're not, uh, just be reminded that if you do have prayer, prayer needs, uh, you can still contact the church and let us know that, and we will update our prayer list on our website. Uh, there's been multiple people keeping in contact with folks throughout this whole thing and uh, just making sure they're doing okay. Uh, one of the things that I do want to just remind you of or ask you to be praying for is uh, on our prayer list is Marty Hurd is going to be having a procedure done uh, in May, 
and uh, she asked if you would be praying for her. And so uh, I wanted to let you know that, that you can be praying for Marty as she gets this procedure done. And as I said, if you have prayer requests, please let us know. Hopefully you've been able to uh, check in with uh, some life groups and maybe some connection groups and uh, still staying connected, even though we have to be socially distant at this at this point. So I'm going to continue with uh, our uh, sermon series of uh, understanding the Holy Spirit and uh, kind of continue on. We'll be still in the Old Testament. As I said, we're going to be looking at some things in the Old Testament first and then moving into the New Testament. Everybody oftentimes thinks of uh, the Holy Spirit just simply being a part of the New Testament, but uh, God's work through the Holy Spirit was alive and well, as we saw last week, from page one of the Bible. And so we're going to continue to see how the Spirit works throughout the Old Testament, because that's going to help us understand uh, what the New Testament authors are writing about, because I think it's super important that we understand the work of the Holy Spirit through the, whole te the Old Testament, because the authors and writers of the New Testament are steeped in Jewish thought and Hebrew thinking. Uh, they don't stop thinking like uh, the Jews thought simply because we're in a New Testament time and they're writing in a different language. They would have been steeped in what we call our Old Testament, which they would have had the Torah, uh, the, the first five books of the Bible, the prophets, and uh, the wisdom literature that they would have studied their entire lives and uh, from that is where they're getting their understanding, their thinking, their ideas about the Holy Spirit. So it's important for us uh, to understand how the Holy Spirit worked in the Old Testament as we move into the New Testament and see how the Holy Spirit kind of works in a maybe new way, different way than the Old Testament, but still the same spirit that God gave Jesus, that God gives to us, that was there Hovering over the waters in the beginning is the same spirit uh, from the old to the new. And I also, as I've mentioned multiple times on a Sunday morning in, when we're together in a worship service, I think it's important for us to be in the Old Testament because there's some today that don't think we need it quite as much. Just the New Testament, that's where we hear about Jesus, that's where we hear about the church, and that's kind of what we as the church should be focusing on. And I disagree with that. I think we don't understand the New Testament without the Old Testament, especially, as I said, all of these writers of the New Testament are Jews. They are Hebrew thinking people. And so they would have thought that way. And so I think it's important for us to bring the old into the new to give us a fuller, deeper understanding of how uh, God, uh, God works in both Testaments and God continues to work in our lives today. So we're going to uh, get started uh, working through the Old Testament. Again, um, as you can, I'll advance my uh, slide so you can see where uh, we're going to begin. As was true last week, and it's going to be true this week again, the scriptures are going to be uh, an assortment of scriptures. It's not going to be just one that we're going to be looking at, as we had been doing in the series of John. Uh, for this first part, and in some of the New Testament portion of when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, it's going to be more of a selection of scriptures. And so I do on this slide have those up for you, and we'll be either touching on some of those, or I'll reference some of those. Like I did last week, I did do a just recap of Sunday's message uh, during the week. I'll, I'll try and do that again for you, because one of the things I did was I showed these slides again because I know people like to take notes, and if you can't remember what he said about that scripture verse or which one that was and where it was in the Bible, that um, that hopefully recap will help you write some of that stuff down and, and have some of those scriptures on hand. So these are going to be some of the ones we're going to be looking at uh, today that I'll be referencing in some way. But as I did last week, as I do typically, I want to begin with prayer, and as we had done with um, the song this morning, inviting the Holy Spirit's presence, because the Holy Spirit has a way in shaping our thinking, our thoughts. And we're going to talk about what that means and how God does that, and one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit and, and what he does in our lives. And 
Uh, I believe that as I share with you from God's word that we believe is inspired by the Holy Spirit, that he uses that word to speak to us today. That the Holy Spirit wasn't just speaking to the biblical author, but continues to speak to us through his word uh, today. So let's begin our uh, time of worship in God's word with prayer. God, we're thankful for this beautiful day that you have given to us. Uh, what a, a wonderful day to wake up on a Sunday morning, even though we can't be together, Lord, and just have the sun shining and the, the skies blue, and it's just a great reminder, God, of your goodness. New mercies we'll see every morning, and today, Lord, we're thankful for this morning, for the opportunity for us to be together, even though we can't physically be together, and even though I have to represent lots of people with pictures, uh, Lord, we're thankful we can be together in spirit. Uh, through your Holy Spirit. And now, God, as we uh, come to you and, and through your word and, and ask God that you would open up our minds, open up our hearts, open up us, Lord, to the Spirit's work and what the Spirit de desires to do in our lives, Lord, help us uh, not to fight against that, but be open to his moving and working. Uh, Lord, we're praying that your presence would be felt in our lives. As we talked about last week, Lord, the, the Holy Spirit is First and foremost, your presence in our lives, your personal presence in the lives of your people. We're so thankful, God, for your presence and the way that that uh, influences us, the way that that encourages us, the way that that comforts us. Uh, your presence is like uh, none other, Lord. And so we ask, God, as we open up your word, that you would speak to us through it, Lord. I do pray that uh, through this series that we're doing of understanding the Holy Spirit and and understanding your presence in our lives, Lord, that you would help each of us, you would help our church uh, be more open to the Spirit's work in our lives. And as a result, Lord God, we'll see many more people come to know Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to get started. And um, I want to begin by asking you a question. And obviously, you can't respond to me. Uh, you can on on your comments. If you want to comment, you can comment. But like I said before, if I look at the comments and try and read them, I get pretty distracted. It's hard for me to do multiple things at once. But I want to ask you, where does inspiration come from? Have you ever been inspired to do something? Or what inspires you? What is it that inspires you? Some, I would maybe argue that my inspiration comes from a good cup of coffee in the morning. Uh, from my mug that I showed you last Sunday, world's best boss that I got from my wife. Sermons are good. My, my pastor, when I was in Reamstown, had a sign on his in his office that said sermons are good but they're better with Starbucks I think specifically was better with Starbucks that's generally what I drink but inspiration where does inspiration come from and what does that mean I want to use uh, I want to define it for you I didn't put it in my slide but I'm going to use my technology here to give you some definitions of inspiration or the word inspire. Fill, this is the definition uh, from Oxford Dictionary. Inspire is to fill someone with the urge or ability to do or feel something, especially to do something creative. Another definition might be create a feeling, especially a positive one, in a person. Another is animate someone with, such as a feeling, to animate someone. We, we heard about that word last week, that animating presence. What is it that animates the trees? It's the wind. Well, where does that come from? And we learned that Hebrew word last week. We'll hear about that again. Number two, those are all the first uh uh, definitions of inspired. And then it also says, breathe in, in parentheses, air, inhale. 
So the word actually comes from the Latin in, into, and I don't know how to say that other Latin word, spirare, what means into and then breathe. So even the word inspire we see comes from this idea of breathing in. When, when we feel inspired, it's almost like it didn't come from us. We got this inspiration from something outside of us, which inspired us to draw a picture, to write something, to do something, as the definition said, creative, to come up with a great idea. We were inspired by something. And the, the language itself is kind of indicating that inspiration didn't come from us. It came from somewhere else, something else. So to be inspired is to, from without, generate some kind of idea or some kind of thing in us to do something. So that word's going to be important today. And again, as we see, it's coming from the Latin breathe, breath, into. And we know that the Hebrew word has this same kind of idea. And we'll, we'll be reminded of that. The other thing is that we were talking about um, last week about um, God's breath, about wind, about spirit. These are all invisible things. We can't see them. And so the Hebrew writer plays on that with the, the Hebrew word. And if, if you can remember what the Hebrew word is, go ahead and, and make a comment in our Facebook comments. If you can remember the Hebrew word I used for breath or divine breath, God's breath, breath or spirit or wind, go ahead and write it in the comments. See how many of you remember that. We're going to be worrying about it again today. But they're, they're invisible. And so when you feel inspired to do something, you think, where did that come from? And you can't see it. So if I was sitting here thinking about something and all of a sudden I felt inspired with this new idea that is invisible. But if I was sitting here and I was thinking about something and, you know, what are we going to do as Grace Church when all this ends, we get back together, what's going to be different? And I just sat here and thought about it for a while. And you're watching me sit here and think. And then all of a sudden this popped up. What does that mean? A light bulb pops up above my head. What would you think? You'd think, wow, Ted must have had a brilliant idea. The light bulb is telling you I had this idea because you can't see it. I couldn't pl pluck it out of my brain and put it somewhere and say, oh, there it was. There's the idea. What you would see is the results of the inspiration I received, the idea that came into my brain and my thinking, and then me actually acting on it. And you would see the result of what that idea was. Yes, some of you are writing it in. Thank you. Ruach. Yes, we're going to hear that word again today. And that word is going to come into play with how God's Ruach impacts, influences our Ruach. Yes, we all, as Humans have spirit. But in Hebrew thinking, there was no word. In Hebrew, there's no word for brain. They didn't have a Hebrew word for brain. And that's what we think of when we think thoughts, intent, our frame of mind. We, we point to this. If I use the phrase, oh, he was thinking with his head, or he was thinking with his heart, you would know there's a distinction. Well, he must have been thinking logically, rationally. Uh, he was taking all the facts together, and that's how he formed his opinion about something. Or if he was emotional about it, crying over it, feeling something, compassionate, and then he made a decision as a result of that, you'd say he was thinking with his heart. So we separate the two. In Hebrew thinking, they did the same, except they didn't use brain. They would have used man's spirit. It's in man's spirit that all that happens. And so the English translation translates it as mind. So that we know the Hebrew word ruach can mean God's breath. We learned what, when God breathed into 
Adam and made him a living being, the word that was used was ruach. When we see the wind animating the trees, and we say, well, what is that? The Hebrew would say it's ruach. And if we're talking about that place where this came from, this wonderful idea came from, well, where did that come from? And how did he come up with that? We would say, well, that was in his spirit or ruach. It's invisible. You can't see it. I can't pluck it out for you. Where is it happening? Where is it taking place? Well, in the Hebrew mind, that was taking place in the man's spirit, in a, in a human being's spirit. They wouldn't point to the mind like we would. They would say spirit. And they also made the distinction from spirit and heart. So in Deuteronomy, when it gives the Shema, what the, the Hebrews would have said, Jews would have said in the morning, the afternoon, and the evening, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus added that to it. But you're loving the Lord your God with all of your heart. That's a different thing than what the Hebrew would have been thinking about with man's spirit. And so that's important as we understand how the English Bible translates spirit and what's going on and how God's using his spirit to work in man's spirit and how God chooses to influence us. Now remember that word inspire. The word inspire seems to convey this idea of something outside of us giving us this idea, this thought, this frame of mind, our intents, our intent from without, not from within. That's what the word inspire is communicating. And that is kind of how God's spirit works within our spirit. He influences us, our thinking, our intentions, our frame of mind, the way that we see the world. God's Spirit has the ability to do that, and we'll look at some examples in the Old Testament specifically about how God's Spirit does that. But let's just look at what God's Spirit does. We know that there's a couple of different ways and different nuances that in Hebrew, which is what the Old Testament was written in, kind of comes up with uh, or defines, translates Spirit. We as English speakers have to take that one word, Ruach, and translated a bunch of different ways, and we got to understand what is the context of it so we know which word to use in English so that it conveys the idea that the biblical author wanted to convey. Now we can, from last week, remember that God's Ruach was there in the beginning, hovering over the waters, and we see that God's Spirit, and again we were talking about this Chaos and the idea of water conveys that in the ancient Near Eastern world. Anytime you would have used that phrasing and lots of other religions use the very same phrasing about what the gods had to do to create things. They fought against the waters of chaos, whereas God's spirit is the only one that seems to have any movement. The others are still kind of conveying this idea that God is the sole authority over all things, and he didn't fight against the waters to create life and earth. He simply spoke, his ruach, breath came out, and it was. God said, and it was. That's what we read in the beginning. So we know that God's spirit is given to us. God's Spirit animates all of life. We call that His divine breath. We, we use the example of a baby, a child. When that child is born, they breathe in. If they don't, they won't have life. They are breathing in something from outside of themselves. Life is contingent upon this thing that we have no control over. It's just there. It's air. Yeah, we can dirty the air, we talked about with pollution, but that air is given to us. Where does that come from? We said that God's breath, God's spirit, God's life animates all of life. Creation itself, it's animating the trees, it's animating the animals, it's 
animating everything. So we said God's spirit is this, this energy that animates all of life. God's spirit has the power to create. God's spirit, as we're going to look at today, and then next week we're going to talk about number three, if you're looking at my slide, if you can actually see it. I know it's small. God's spirit has a power of recreation. And we'll, we'll talk about how God's spirit does that in the Old Testament before we get to the New Testament. But today we're going to talk about another job of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's job doesn't change in the New Testament. It might come about in different ways. God might use his spirit to do his work a little bit different, as we'll see. And as the Old Testament writers and prophets looked forward to that day when God's spirit dwelled on all people, today we're going to look at how God's spirit influences or empowers God's people to do his work. How does his ruach influence ours? Because that's part of the job of the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to look at how the Holy Spirit appointed people, commissioned people, influenced them, empowered them. All throughout the Old Testament, we see God's Spirit doing this in different ways to different, to different people. God's Spirit would come upon someone and would influence that person's way of thinking. It would influence their intentions, their, their frame of mind, their mindset. These are all invisible ideas, and God's Spirit is invisible. And again, the, the Hebrew author is playing on that word, on how God's Ruach influences ours and the work of His Spirit throughout the Old Testament. But oftentimes the language that is used is that God's Spirit comes upon them, they are anointed in some way, this physical action takes place, to convey something that is invisible. And we'll hear about that too when Jesus is baptized and we hear about the Holy Spirit coming upon him. And why is it that we see a dove? Or that is, the author writes, a dove descended. In the Old Testament, the same thing is happening when they are using oil to anoint people. That's a very Old Testament kind of idea, concept that does carry over in the New Testament. But this this invisible thing is taking place, but we use some kind of physical action, physical thing to convey the fact that something is happening from without us that's going to influence us. And we can allow God's Spirit to influence us, or we don't have to. God's Spirit isn't forced upon someone to make us think God's thoughts. And so you have the ability to allow God's Holy Spirit. That's why when I say being open to the Holy Spirit, what does that even mean? If we're using John's gospel again as our kind of launching pad to this whole discussion of the Holy Spirit in John 13 uh, through 18, when we looked at that during the week of Holy Week, Jesus is really nailing this idea of the Holy Spirit. And he says that if you abide in me and I abide in you, you can... Do the work that Jesus is doing. Because Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, what does that mean? Obviously, Jesus is going to be apart from the disciples. He's going to leave. Jesus ascended, and Jesus isn't sitting next to me. And I can put my, I'll go this way. I can put my arm around him and say, hey, thanks for hanging out with me, Jesus. I can't do that. So how is it that apart from Jesus, we can do nothing when we are actually apart? What is it that we can allow in our lives that shows we are abiding in Jesus. The Holy Spirit enables us, empowers us, appoints us, gives us some kind of task. Often, when we read the Holy Spirit's work in the Old Testament, it is to complete some kind of task that God has. The Spirit comes on a person, rests on a person, and permeates every aspect of maybe their leadership, as we see in David's life. When, when Samuel went to David and God had rejected Saul as king, this is in 1 Samuel, and, and God rejected Saul as king because Saul had rejected God. He was doing his own thing. And God says to Samuel, a, a prophet, God speaks to him and says, I've, I've 
anointed someone else to, to be king. And so Samuel goes to, to Jesse's family, and Jesse parades all of his sons before Samuel, and then none of them are the the the, the guy that God has said that's that's who the next king's gonna be. And he says, Well, who who else is left? And of course, David, who was out tending the flocks, comes and God says to Samuel, This is him. This is who I am anointing. And and it says that Samuel anoints David and God's spirit comes upon him because God has a task for David to do. And God's spirit, as we see, permeates David's life. Now, I think it's important for us to remember and understand if we follow David's life and we listen to this language in 1 Samuel chapter 16, I think, if, of where it says that God's spirit rests upon him or comes upon him or God or Samuel anoints him with God's spirit. And then God's spirit enables David, empowers David to do a task, and that is to lead God's people. Does that automatically mean David lived the perfect life? No, it doesn't. If you know anything about David's life, you know he was far from perfect. In fact, when David starts fleeing from Saul, the first thing he does is he goes to his enemies to look for some refuge because Saul wants to kill him because he knows David's going to be king. And so David runs away. He lies to his enemy and pretends to be insane so that they won't hurt him. And so this God who said, I'm going to anoint you, I'm going to protect you, I'm going to make you king, David already lacks the faith and trust to believe that even if Saul wanted to kill him, God would protect him. And we see David already displaying a lack of trust in God. But in a few chapters previous, we see that God's spirit rests upon him. So God's spirit doesn't forcibly make us perfect and we become robots to do whatever God's willing or what God wills. We have the ability to allow God's spirit to permeate our lives to think different thoughts, to be different people. And we'll talk about that. We'll touch on this idea of recreation. What is God actually doing when he gives us his Holy Spirit? Something that the prophets, something that Old Testament believers looked forward to that day. But what we see is God's Spirit will rest on a person to lead, to do some kind of task. Uh, to create something, and we'll use those examples uh, of what God's Spirit does. And so I want to give you a few examples. Well, I haven't opened up my Bible yet, but we're going to do that now. We're going to look at a few examples of how we see God's Spirit working. And, and the word that I like to use, the word that I've started praying myself for God's Spirit, is that God's Spirit would permeate my life. I, I like that idea of permeate. It like comes over you, and every aspect of your life, God's Spirit can have his hands on to mold and shape. And so it's not like God's Spirit is just something that we want to ask for, pray for when we're all gathered in the church, and you know we sing that song that I played for you, your Holy Spirit we is welcome here, and we want your presence here, and that's great. And we're all singing that and praying that when we're in a worship service together, gathered in our sanctuary, and then we go home, and we go back to our normal life. And then Monday morning, we wake up and go to work, and I want God's Spirit to permeate all of my life so that His Spirit has His way, and I'm open to His Spirit when I'm at work. And I'm dealing with that person that is a challenge to deal with. When I'm dealing with that boss who I really don't like very much and I think is pretty unfair. When I've got those issues with that family member. When I'm looking at my finances and deciding how to spend my money. When I'm dealing with that anger that I have because my kids get on my nerves and I just fly off the handle. When we allow God's spirit to permeate all of our life we're going to see a different life. I mean, that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. That's one of his jobs. And you can fight against that. 
You can not allow that if you don't want to. You can say, God, I want your spirit to work in my life and I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to go to church. But I'm going to have the same attitude towards my spouse when they make me mad. I'm going to have that same attitude towards that coworker when they do something to wrong me. I'm going to have that same attitude towards the people that have wronged me. I'm going to stay bitter about that. I'm going to hold a grudge about that. Every aspect of our life needs to be permeated by the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, we'll see God does some recreating. But before we get there, let's look at a few examples of how we see God's Holy Spirit working in the Old Testament. And I'm going to just list a couple here, and I just kind of gave you three categories, uh, priests, prophets, and kings, how God's Spirit influenced them. I've got three specific examples of the language that the Scripture uses about God's Spirit. So we began in Genesis last week talking about the Holy Spirit of God and God's Spirit having a job in creation. And God's Spirit brings life to all living things, and specifically, God breathes life into Adam. But now in Genesis chapter 41, we see God's Spirit doing something else. And this time, God's Spirit is working in an individual's life, in a, in a human being's life. I'm not going to read everything. I'm just going to read the scripture verse I have highlighted, Genesis chapter 41, verse 38. But if you read through Genesis and you get into Joseph's story, you probably remember uh, Joseph, his brothers sold him into slavery. And eventually Joseph ends in Egypt as a slave. And Joseph is down there uh, doing his thing. And he uh, rises to power and eventually is almost second in command to, to Pharaoh. And he's in Pharaoh's house, and Pharaoh's wife has a thing for Joseph and tries to seduce Joseph. And eventually Joseph runs out of there, but she steals something from him to say, look what he did. He tried to uh, throw himself on me. And Joseph eventually gets tossed in jail. And so Joseph is now doing his thing in jail, and eventually two people from Pharaoh's court his cook and his uh, taste tester, the guy who would drink out of the cup of Pharaoh to make sure it's not poison. This dude would do it. And if he got poisoned and died, well, I'm not going to drink that. Next guy. These two guys and his official baker, the guy who was preparing a lot of the meals for Pharaoh, they got tossed into jail. They have a couple of dreams. Joseph interprets, the, interprets those dreams. The one guy dies. The other guy lives, heads back to Pharaoh's uh, palace. And now Pharaoh has some dreams. Maybe you remember the story about Pharaoh's dreams and uh, the seven years of plenty, the seven years of famine, and all those dreams, Pharaoh couldn't figure it out. And so he calls in his magicians to figure out his dreams because Pharaoh's asleep. He's unconscious. Something is happening from outside of his conscious thinking, giving him these dreams he calls in his magicians to figure out what in the world do these things mean. None of them can figure it out. But the guy who was in jail that is now back in Pharaoh's palace remembers Joseph and says, wait, I remember a guy that interpreted my dream and it actually came true. And the, and the other dream he interpreted came true. So let's call Joseph. And so that's what happens. They tell Joseph, they get him cleaned up so he doesn't stink come to Pharaoh, he's been in prison for a while, comes to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh tells him the dreams that he had. Joseph interprets those dreams and basically says, it's not me, uh, it's God. He says, I, I can't interpret those dreams for you, Pharaoh. In verse 25, it says in chapter 41, then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. God is doing this revealing. And so Joseph tells him these dreams and tells him what they mean and basically is going to save all of Egypt. And ultimately, Joseph saves his whole family because they eventually head down to Egypt 
because that's the only place there is food. And it says this in verse 38 of chapter 41. So Pharaoh asked them, everybody standing around there, all of his magicians, everybody that's gathered in the palace to hear these dreams. Can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the spirit of God? For the first time, we hear this reference to Pharaoh understands what, that what Joseph just said didn't come from Joseph. We'll just say this. Joseph was inspired to say the things that he said. From outside of Joseph's own thinking, some thing, someone, God or the gods, it could be translated both ways, God or gods, Pharaoh recognizes from without Joseph, Joseph was able to do something amazing. Joseph was inspired by the Spirit of God to reveal to Pharaoh what was about to happen. And so the Spirit of God is upon Joseph. We read that, and from everything Joseph has done, we recognize the Spirit of God is on Joseph as he basically is saving almost all of the world through the, the, the things he puts in place, the policies he puts in place, and certainly saves Israel from the famine that they're going to experience. And from without Joseph, he's inspired to say these things. And the Spirit of God permeates Joseph, Joseph's life. Joseph's ideas, Joseph has an idea. He said, oh, I got an idea. Here's what we should do. Pharaoh, let, let's build some storehouses and store all this food. Let's do this. Let's do that. And Joseph enacts these policies to basically save all of Egypt and his family. And the Spirit of God was upon him. And so who said the, the, the revelation? Was it Joseph or was it God? When, when Joseph says, okay, here's what all this means and here's what we should do. Did Joseph come up with that or did God come up with that? The answer is yes. That's what it looks like when God's Spirit works in our lives. When Ted has this idea, did, did Ted come up with that idea or did God come up with that idea? When, when the Spirit of God permeates our life, God influences our spirit to think in new ways. Our intent, our frame of mind, our way of thinking, our purposes, God influences that. And so we could say, yes, Joseph is the one that did that. But it was actually God who did it. Joseph kind of became that vessel. And so we kind of think that when we, we get inspired by someone. You think of that when people do some kind of amazing painting. And this person says, I was just the vessel for the inspiration that I received to paint what I painted. And it's almost like they just become this conduit with, for something outside of them to do what they've done. And Joseph is basically this vessel that God decides to use to do some amazing things through. And so the, the Joseph spirit was impacted, influenced, empowered by God's ruach to do what he did. And so we see God working in the Old Testament in lots of people's lives to do these kinds of things. So let's fast forward to the book of Exodus. And if you look at Exodus chapter 31, verse 1 through 3, we come to a story about a guy named Bezalel and what his job is. Now, God had given the, the, the law, the Ten Commandments to Moses, and God was describing for Moses all the stuff that was going to make Israel Israel, like the clothes, the, the ephod, the, what the priests were going to wear. That's called the ephod. If you look at uh, chapter 24, God confirms this covenant in the book of Exodus. And then it talks about the offerings for the tabernacle. And it talks about the ark, the ark of the covenant. That was a structure. They were going to build it. It gives you the schematics, a blueprint for that, a blueprint for the table that they were supposed to build, that they're going to put in the tent of meeting, a blueprint for the lampstand that they were going to make, the tabernacle itself. We get a blueprint in chapter 26 in Exodus of what that tabernacle is going to actually look like. And if you've got a, a study Bible, oftentimes they'll actually have the picture. This is what it would have looked like when they was actually built and the different linen they were supposed to use, the altar that they were going to build, what this courtyard is going to look like, the priestly garments that they're going to wear. 
All these things that they're putting on, they're going to wear it, they're going to make it out of material, gold, silver, whatever. All this stuff that's going to be built, where we know the tent of meeting is where God's presence dwelt with Israel in the Old Testament, and then they build the temple. But it began in this tent of meeting. And in verse 1 through 3 of chapter 31, we hear this about the guy that's got to create all this stuff. The guy that's actually going to make it, put it together. Get the material, hammer it, saw it, screw, well, they didn't screw it, nail it, glue it. I don't know if they had glue. However he was going to build it. Verse, 30, or verse 1, chapter 31 says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have, here's the, what we're looking for, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, the Ruach of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, bronze, to cut and set stones and work in wood and engage in all kinds of crafts. So the Spirit of God is given to this guy, and he eventually teaches other people He's kind of the master craftsman, and he teaches other people to do the work of actually building and making this thing. And so the Spirit of God inspires Bezalel, who maybe he really enjoyed this kind of stuff. He, he loved working with his hands, but God empowers him to, to create and to make something from raw materials. The, the same, so this language that is being used in Exodus chapter 31 is the same language that is being used in the book of Proverbs. And I'm not sure if I put that on the list for you. I'll have to make a note to myself to, to put that in there. I don't know if I actually did it for you. The book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verse 19 and 20, that same language is used when it's talking about God creating the world. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul is writing about this same idea of what God is doing in building the church. They are taking these raw materials, this nothingness, this inanimate object, and creating beauty and creating meaning. So this piece of wood that is nothing, it's just a tree in the forest, gets cut down and brought into Bezalel, and from that... He creates meaning, and he creates something beautiful. The same idea is being used in Genesis, and what God is taking from nothing and creating this beautiful garden creates meaning and beauty. Paul is saying the same thing about what he's striving to do with the church, where God is creating out of raw materials and out of chaos, bringing order and establishing meaning and beauty. God's spirits, that is one of the jobs of God's spirit in our lives. He's able to take us and use us in such a way. Remember, he took dirt, and out of this dirt, out of this raw material, he made something beautiful and attached meaning to it. And so the Spirit of God in our lives empowers us to do these kinds of things. It's almost like God is creating this amazing tapestry where on the one side you see this beautiful picture, but if you flip it around, you see lots of different strings and lots of different, it almost looks like chaos on the other side, but on the other side you see something beautiful. God's Spirit does that in our lives. So if we do something, I think about this when we were talking about, as an example, in the here and now. When I first came to Grace Church, and I wanted to see God be able to work in people's lives, I wanted to see us go deeper with God, I wanted to see us go deeper as brothers and sisters in Christ. What what can we do? This wasn't some idea that I just developed. The way it came about was maybe different in our church than in others. 
But I wanted to see all that happen. And so I certainly prayed about all that. I talked to other people about all that. And the idea that sprung up was we need to have life groups. So how are we going to do life groups? Now, I couldn't plug something into my ear and project that onto the same screen that you're looking at. And you can see all the ideas forming and how it all fit together. It just came from somewhere. And so we started putting things into place to help us do life groups because I believed those life groups would help us go deeper with God and deeper with one another, that we would actually experience authentic, genuine relationships, not just these Sunday morning, oh, hey, how you doing on a Sunday morning? Okay, we'll see you later. And we know nothing about each other's lives. Or when we're trying to figure out, well, how do I even live this life out with Jesus? I don't even, I'm just starting. I don't even get it. How do I do that? Well, you can come alongside another brother or sister who's doing the same thing. Where did all that come from? I couldn't put it somewhere. Maybe if you were sitting with me in my office and I was praying about it and, and this happened, uh oh, Ted's got an idea. This is dangerous. We're not sure what's going to happen here. Where did it come from? Ted or God? Well, I think if we're looking at the Old Testament, we'd say, yes, both. Man, this beautiful piece of artwork, where did that come from? Bezalel or from God? We see that he is filled with the Spirit of God. God's Spirit influences him, impacts him, and creates beauty where there was just raw material. That same language is used of the beginning of creation. Paul uses that same language as he talks about the church. So we see God's spirit is used. He uses his spirit to impact, influence us. Lastly, the last example we're going to look at is Joshua in the book of Deuteronomy. Joshua has to take over for Moses no uh, small task after we read all about Moses' exploits in the Old Testament. And he's basically like when kids dressed up and wanted to be superheroes, they were Moses in the Old Testament. That's who they dressed up as. And so now Joshua has got to take over for this dude. And so verse 9 of, of chapter 34, M Moses is not going into the promised land. God says to Joshua, you're taking this group in there and you're going to lead them. It says this, now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom, or literally it, it translates as the spirit that bestows wisdom, because Moses had laid his hands on him. So we see something physical. We, we don't see the spirit that bestows wisdom, which is a clear reference to God's spirit, that one of God's attributes is wisdom. Did you ever read the book of Proverbs? That's all talking about the spirit of God, the wisdom literature. This spirit, we're referencing the spirit of God here, fills Joshua. Well, if I'm just staring at Joshua, I don't know that that happened. Some, Moses does something physical so people can see that. And we do that all the time. When we've prayed for me, we've prayed for other people in our own church sanctuary, we would lay hands on people because we're doing something physically, asking God to fill that person with his spirit. And so this happens to Joshua because God has a task with Joshua. You know that land that looks really scary over there? You're going to go take it and I'm giving it to you. You know these people that you were with Moses and you watched all the struggles Moses had trying to lead them? You're going to be that guy now. And so Joshua becomes this vessel that God uses to do God's task. God does it in the book of Judges, and we learn about some judges that didn't really necessarily have the best moral character, and yet God's Spirit rests upon them to do something. We read about it in the prophets. We read about it, about I told you about King David. It said it about King Saul as well, that God's spirit was on Saul. And then God's spirit leaves Saul and God's spirit rests on David. And so we see God's spirit doing a lot of work to empower the work of God, to empower what God is bringing about, which started all the way back in Genesis of redeeming all of creation and specifically us. That is the work that God is doing 
that we are reading about through the entire Old Testament that continues into the New Testament, and he is still doing today by the power of his spirit. He is in the process of redeeming all of creation, all of it, and us as well. And he uses his spirit to accomplish that task, and he uses us to do it. Now, in um, Isaiah, the, the prophet Isaiah, which comes immediately after the wisdom literature of Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, we get the, the prophet Isaiah, which is the longest of all the, the prophets, if you're reading any of the prophets, Isaiah is the longest but we come to Isaiah chapter 11, and in Isaiah chapter 11, we hear something very interesting. The last time I read Isaiah chapter 11, if anybody remembers, if anybody remembers what, what uh, I read or from what seems like a million years ago, Christmas time, Advent, we read Isaiah chapter 11, and it says this, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of God will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. If you remember why we read Isaiah chapter 11 at Advent is because we believe that that is Isaiah prophetically talking about the Messiah. This human being who will be so hyper-influenced, who the Spirit of God will permeate his entire life, he will be the Messiah. And so Isaiah is prophesying about a time in which the Holy Spirit will descend upon this human who will do exactly what God's Spirit intends to do in our lives, but that human will be open to the Holy Spirit, allow the Holy Spirit to permeate every aspect of his life. How was it Jesus was able to do all that he did, even though he bore the flesh you and I bear? The New Testament says, Paul says, it was through the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus was enabled to do all these things, to be divine and yet bear our flesh. He, the one human being, that perfectly allows the Holy Spirit of God to work in and through him. That is why we have the Trinity, God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is another aspect of that that we see working out in Jesus' life. And Isaiah prophesied about a time that that would come. Now, we also hear about in Ezekiel, and we're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 37, the, the prophet's looking for a time, and, and the prophet Joel, a much shorter book of the Old Testament, talks about this time when God's Spirit descends upon all people. And if you know your book of Acts, you know that, and we'll talk about this, that Peter quotes that very scripture in the book of Acts on a particular day. So the prophets are looking forward to this time where God's Spirit is going to rest on people. Now, how is God's Spirit going to do that? And, and what is He going to do? What is God's Spirit going to do when He does rest on those people? Ezekiel chapter 37 talks about and touches on, and that's what we're going to be looking at next week when we finish up in the Old Testament about the Holy Spirit and get into the New Testament. We talked about God's Spirit being a part of creation. From Genesis chapter 1, we talked about today how God's Spirit empowers people to, go, to do what God desires to do, and that is to redeem all of creation and all of humanity. And we will talk about next week the Spirit of God recreating. What is the Spirit of God doing in us? What are we allowing the Spirit of God to do in us? What does it look like if the Spirit of God permeates all aspects of my life? What changes in me? What do, what do I think? How's things going to change up here? Ezekiel 37 talks about God's ability to recreate. And it's a familiar story about this valley of dry bones that Ezekiel is looking out upon. And we're going to hear about the Spirit's ability to recreate. 
And so what I encourage you to pray this week is to ask God, Lord, how can I allow your spirit to permeate all aspects of my life? God, how can you empower me to do the work you have for me? The work God has for you probably looks different than the work God has for me. And maybe you can be the, the best teacher you can be. And, and how does God use that aspect, fill you with his spirit to do that? Maybe you're an engineer. Maybe you're a mom who's just who stays at home with the kids, and now you're also a teacher because you're homeschooling. How, what does it look like when my life is permeated by the, by the Holy Spirit? And I want to encourage you to pray that. That's what I've been praying. I, I want God's Holy Spirit to permeate all of my life. And I want to see what does God do? What happens in my life when God does that? And what recreation is God working on when he does that? So next week we'll talk about that in Ezekiel chapter 37. So let me close with some prayer. God, thank you for your Holy Spirit that works and moves in our lives. God, your Spirit that helps us uh, live the life that we as followers of Jesus, desire to live. And God, we know that that doesn't mean we become these perfect people. Uh, we know that that didn't happen when your spirit rested upon these other individuals in the, in the Old Testament, and yet you were still able to use them. And so God, my prayer is that your Holy Spirit would be able to permeate all aspects of my life. Those areas in which I am anxious, Lord God, and I just lack that peace because of what's going on in this world. Those areas in which, Lord God, I just seem to be angry all the time or things just kind of set me off edge or those areas in which I just kind of leave you out of, maybe my finances, maybe some of my relationships that I have with, with my family, my friends, maybe my spouse. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just permeate our lives, Lord God, so, so that we would be enabled to do, empowered to do what you have called us to do, Lord. And that is to bring about and share this, this new kingdom, share about you and your story of redemption that you began writing through this unlikely people, uh, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and we see it in Joseph, and then Moses and David, Lord, and now through unlikely people like us. God, may your spirit uh, just reign supreme in our lives and in your church. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks everybody for uh, joining me this morning with uh, our worship service. I am going to try and turn my camera around. I hope it, that it doesn't freeze. And I'm going to turn this around so that you can see what's what I'm looking at today. I'm doing it really slow so that it doesn't freeze. And I'm going to move this out of the way. Now I'm looking at myself live and I don't see it actually happening. So I turn the camera around and oh, there's some congregation members right there. And we're looking at all of the, the lovely pictures uh, that I got to look at today as well. So thanks to everybody who made that uh, possible. And there was one picture on there on the on the uh, the string of congregation members that were looking at me. Uh, I've not seen this congregation member before, but he's here today, and he has a really good quote. In case you are just struggling and you need, you need something to lift your spirits. Uh, I'm looking right now at one of those pictures and it's Sasquatch. And, you know, Sasquatch says, believe in yourself even when no one else will. So I hope you're encouraged by Sasquatch. I don't know if I'll see Sasquatch at Grace Church, but in my fellowship hall with these pictures of congregation members, I am seeing Sasquatch right now. And that's what he had to say for us today. Believe in yourself, even if no one else will. Thanks for tuning in for our worship service today. Stay tuned at our Facebook page for some updates this week. And I will see you later.